Back in 2009, me, my mum and my stepdad moved into a really old, rustal, rural cottage in England. My father had passed away not too long before, and this was going to be a new start for all of us. The house was an absolute bargain. It had six bedrooms, two very spacious living rooms, and a huge annex at the back that was essentially a second house. We couldn't work out why it was so cheap. We went for the viewing and the family eventually told us that their elderly mother had passed away there peacefully in the annex and they just needed to get away from the feeling of her. We weren't put off and we bought the house. From the off, it was unsettling. My parents didn't see it at first, but I was incredibly uncomfortable there. It was extremely unnerving and cold and not to mention it was isolated behind rows of trees and a very long driveway, so far away from anyone else. It started on the first night. My room was at the end of the corridor. And if you came out of my room, on the right was a bathroom and a locked door that led to the annex. My parents slept a long way down the corridor in the last bedrooms, so I was quite isolated. And directly opposite me were the stairs. The first night, it was freakishly cold. I pulled my blankets up to my head, but after my dad passed away, I had suffered from insomnia for years. So the cold and the anxieties of moving to a new house all added together with this into zero sleep. So I ended up laying awake for hours just sort of staring around the room. My bedroom door was one of those old and mismatched wooden country house doors. It didn't quite reach the carpets. And after a few hours, I could hear the creaking of floorboards directly outside my room and shadows that seemed even darker than the darkness of the hallway walking past my door. I presumed one of my parents had gotten up to use the bathroom at first, but this went on, back and forth, back and forth for several minutes. And it was fast, a very brisk walk. And not to mention, next to my door was the locked door to the annex. Anybody walking at that speed would have hit the door, but nothing. It freaked me out and had me dreading the next night. This kept happening, every night for a few weeks. And I remember vividly one night I actually left my bedroom door open. Around the same time, I heard the creaking. I turned around and unmistakably there was a figure, blacker than black, walking forward and backwards in front of the door, just visible in the darkness of the hallway. I couldn't take my eyes off it the entire time it was there. Safe to say, I never slept with the door open again after that night. But this is where things start to get properly creepy. I've been terrified of this shadow for weeks now. There was a really horrible feeling I had around it, like it was after me. And one night, as I was going downstairs for dinner, I had the same cold feeling. And for just a second, I froze in place in the dark hallway and looked to my right towards the annex door. And there, sure as anything, and without my sleepy eyes to blame it on, I saw the same black shadow walking directly at me at high speed. I ran downstairs as quickly as I could and told my parents everything. They mostly laughed it off and didn't believe me and tried to reassure me that ghosts aren't real and there was no chance of anything about this old lady still being in the house. Now, a bit of backstory. This old lady was terrified of the previous owner's family dog. So much so that they had installed a pulley system in the house so she could pull a cord from her bedroom that would trigger an old bell to ring in the kitchen if she wanted anything. The whole system was still there when we moved in, and this night, I was awoken at around 2.30 a.m. by this bell in the kitchen ringing, loud, and on repeat, like it was being pulled firmly and constantly. I ran out into the corridor, and my parents were there too, equally as confused and concerned as I was. We all looked at each other with ever-increasing worry, and ran downstairs into the kitchen to see what was going on. As soon as we entered the kitchen, it stopped. We ventured up into the annex to see what could have caused this, but nothing. No sign of anyone. And my God, I hated it there. It was even colder and more lifeless than the main part of the house, and I just felt like I needed to leave as soon as I could. My parents didn't quite believe that this was a ghost yet, but they were clearly less skeptical than before. For here, any activity became much more obvious. We started to hear knocking from the annex door next to my bedroom. 
Noises from downstairs that sounded like someone was down there moving. Sometimes my fish tank light would flick on and off with an audible click and wake me up. And I would often wake up to my wardrobe doors being wide open with no breeze in sight. One night, I was sitting reading alone in my room and one of these wardrobe doors opened by itself wide and with relative force. I got up cautiously, closed it and ran downstairs to see my parents. When I came up around 15 minutes later, every single cupboard door, around a dozen of them, was open as wide as they could go. Lots more went on too. Taps turning themselves on became a particularly regular occurrence. And one night, I awoke to the sound of my cupboard door opening again and saw droplets of water running from the bathroom next to the annex door, all the way to a few feet from my bed, with no droplets out again. I was terrified. It was around six months after all of this started that we eventually moved out. My grandma had begun to grow unwell and couldn't care for herself anymore, and she moved in with us. From the beginning, she hated the house. My grandma was so incredibly sweet and calm, and I've never seen her distressed like she was there. And one night in particular, when I was sitting downstairs in the kitchen with her, she took my hand, pointed directly towards the annex and said, Don't you go in there. I don't like it here. It's safe to say this scared the crap out of me. On the last night we all spent together in that house, I was awoken by my mum screaming. Clear as day, she said she felt two hands firmly grab her ankles over the bed sheets and pull her down the bed just a few inches. And right there and then, she asked to leave. We went to stay in our old house for a while, but because of the size of my stepdad, the biggest skeptic among us, stayed in Lilac College for a few more months. He's still quiet to this day about that house. He hates talking about it. But even he admits that there was something incredibly wrong there. And without much warning, he put the house up for sale, selling it so desperately that he lost almost a quarter of the price he paid for it. He's never told us why. I've promised myself that one day, I'll reach out to the current owners of that house and see if they've also experienced anything. I have a few experiences that I can write about, but it's only minor little things. The story you're about to hear is by far the most scared I've ever been. My five months of torment. Before I start this story, I'd like to just explain a few things. Since my nan's deaths and the hardships I faced growing up, I've always felt my nan with me. From about 18 to 19 onwards to the present day, she's helped me in little bits here and there. Because of her being with me, I feel sensitive to other spirits around me. I'm not saying I'm a medium and should be most haunted, but I do sense a lot of things. I don't see spirits in general, but I see them through my mind's eye. It's like a visual representation of what my eyes don't see. If I mention the mind's eye through anything I've written, you will understand where it comes from. At the age of 23, I moved out of my nan's house. It was a very sad but happy moment for me. I was finally getting on with my life, moving forward. As my life changed, so did my five-year relationship with my partner, which ended. The house I moved to was a decent size. You couldn't tell by looking at it from the outside, though. It was longer than it was wide. From the door, the hallway leads up to the bottom of the stairs with two doors on the left-hand side. The door closest to the front door leads to a small front room, and the second door leads to a bigger middle room, which was an open plan, combined with a small kitchen. There were two doors in the kitchen. The one on the left led to the garden, and the one on the right led to the bathroom. It had three bedrooms, and the only toilet was in the bathroom. The first day I moved in was amazing. I never felt better. While John, the homeowner, was out, I decided I'd wash all the new cutlery and plates in the sink. While doing so, I heard footsteps from the hallway. I froze for a split second to take in what I heard, and the footsteps carried on about halfway up the stairs and stopped. I could feel the hairs on my body stand on end. I felt this sudden feeling of dread, and it was really uncomfortable. I shouted, John, with no answer. I knew there couldn't be an answer. After all, nobody came in through the front door. 
Nonetheless, I checked all three bedrooms. Nothing. The house was silent, and I still had this feeling of dread. I carried on with the washing up, trying to forget about it, and about half an hour later, John came home. Everything was okay for a while. I had feelings of dread every now and again, but it was tolerable. Nowhere near as much as when I heard the footsteps. Say two months down the line, when the dark nights were drawing in, I was lying on my bed with my new partner. She was due to go home in about 15 minutes, as her dad was picking her up. She had work the next day, and it was quicker for her to get to work from her house rather than from mine. She used to stay over during the weekends or when our days off matched. Anyways, we were lying in my bed. She looked up and suddenly started shaking. Frozen stiff, but shaking. Staring fixated at the ceiling. When I asked her what was wrong, as it was scaring me a little, she said she saw some kind of smoke appear in the corner of the ceiling. And then a face appeared through the ceiling, staring at her for a few seconds before vanishing. She was as white as a sheet. That same feeling of dread came over me like when I heard the footsteps and it worried me. This feeling of dread seemed more intense. We both decided to go downstairs and wait for her dad in the front room. While there, she just sat quietly until the sound of her dad's horn was heard. While alone, I closed the front room door and sat with the TV on. John came home about 10 minutes later and those 10 minutes in the house alone were very tense for me and felt like hours. Thankfully, John being back took my mind off what had happened. I didn't mention anything to him at this point. It wasn't long after that that I started to sense something around the house during my days off. I couldn't put my finger on what it was at first, but after about half a day, I picked up feelings of sadness and loneliness. A million miles away from the feeling of dread I usually got, which was a breath of fresh air. On a weekend off from work, I came downstairs to have some breakfast, and through my mind's eye on the floor opposite to where I was, I saw a small, long bench with a young child sitting in the middle, crying with his hands clenched, rubbing his eyes. Then it came to me. This was the feeling of sadness and loneliness I was having. He looked about four or five years old. That was the start of it all. Every time after that I'd sense him running around the house, standing or sitting down by me when I was playing my Xbox 360, standing by me watching TV, looking at the food I was eating, and just generally following me around the house. I even got so used to it that I turned CBBS on in front of an, an occasion while I cleaned up or played on the 360 downstairs. The feeling of dread was still looming around the house, but again, it was tolerable. It was faint. I kept that I could sense this little boy to myself. That was until my partner saw this little figure run past my door and then run into my room as if running at her, which made her jolt as if bracing for the impact. That's when I told her that I could sense him around. Before, she could tell me how he looked. I quickly asked her if I could tell her instead. Just so what I was seeing in my mind's eye was right and I wasn't going mad. I've done a lot over the years and I've been right every time. This little boy was wearing dirty black shoes, grey knee-length socks that were down by his ankles in a way that looked scruffy. A pair of dirty black shorts, a grey t-shirt and a grey scruffy cap and that the boy was very thin. My partner confirmed all of this with a startling stare and added that she felt sorry for him. She asked me if I'd seen anything else in the house. I told her I hadn't, but I get this feeling of dread through the whole of the house. She went quiet for a few seconds and then mentioned that she was around on the second night of me living there. She'd gone for a cigarette by the open kitchen door, which led to the garden. After about a minute, she felt someone grab her shoulder, but when she turned, there was no one there as we were all in the front room. And while smoking a fag, she constantly felt that someone was standing right up to her face. John was also interested in the paranormal and it wasn't long until me, my partner, John and a few of his friends were using a makeshift Ouija board. The letters and numbers were all on separate pieces of paper and the words yes and no were to each end of our Ouija board arrangement. We used an overturned glass to put our fingers on. We managed to contact this little boy and we asked him to spell out his name. The pointer went to no. Then it clicked. 
He was too young to spell his name, and he didn't know the year he died either, or the day or the month. It was a shame. As it came about, this spirit boy saw me as a big brother and saw my partner as a mother. Through asking him questions, we found out that the boy was left to die of starvation. His mother went out one day and didn't come back. It upset us all. I asked the boy if there's anyone he didn't like in the house. I asked this because of the feeling of dread I kept having. I wanted to try and understand what and where the feeling of dread was coming from. I knew this feeling was coming from a male, but that was it. I got my answer. The glass moved to yes. I asked more questions. Can you point the glass to where this person is? No. Is the person you don't like in this room? No. Then I asked if the person was upstairs. Yes. Is he upstairs now? Yes. Does he scare you? Yes. Then I asked, there's a male upstairs, isn't there? No answer. So I asked the same question in a different way. Is there a nasty man upstairs? Yes, I'd sensed correctly. There was a male presence. Does the nasty, nasty man live above the bedrooms? Yes, it clicked for both me and my partner. The face she saw through my bedroom ceiling was this man. It wasn't good. I started to push more questions to understand what was going on and to confirm what I felt was going on. Does this man come out at night? Yes. And you hide from him? Yes. Is he angry a lot? Yes. He doesn't like me, does he? No. Because of my nan? Yes. This male presence didn't like John or my partner either. Does he know we're talking about him? Nothing. I asked again. Nothing. All a little freaked out, we decided to call it time as our food was cooked. John closed our session thanking the spirits for our protection and their communication. This male presence became stronger. During the day, the house was filled with more dread. No matter where I went. At night time, I kept the door to my room closed and I could feel this male presence angrily walking around the house, especially walking past my room. I could feel him stopping outside my room and staring at me, as if the door wasn't there, as if he knew exactly where my head was and where I was sitting. This happened every night. At times the feeling was so bad, I wouldn't come out of my room to eat or drink. Only for the toilet would I leave the room and then I'd make sure all the lights were on in the house. From about seven till I went to bed, some nights this male would spend the entire night just staring at me through the door. Those were the times I'd have an early night and want to go to sleep as fast as possible. When my partner stayed over, she'd go downstairs during the night to use the toilet and find the back room and kitchen lights on. Sometimes just the kitchen lights or the back room lights or the front room light would be on. The one time the kitchen light came on its own as she walked to the light switch. Another time she went downstairs to the toilet and she screamed. I ran down the stairs to find her sitting on the bottom step. She told me she opened the door to see the kitchen light flickering on and off with a huge black shape in the middle. I shot into the middle room and the light was on but no black shape. I stayed with her while she went to the toilet and we stayed awake that night. We were tired and thirsty but too scared to do anything. This stuff is happening every other day now. On my day off, I'd avoid trying to go downstairs and I'd get something from the chip shop and eat it on the way home. That way, I could just go straight upstairs. I'd also like to point out that a good chunk of all that I experienced happened while John was away. He was away a lot. Sometimes with work and other times for a break with a few friends. On top of everything that was going on, at the time, I lived in Wolverhampton, but worked in Perry Bar, which isn't far from Birmingham. The days were long. I was up at half five every morning to get to work at half eight, and I'd get home around eight or nine. It was important that I had my sleep. What happened this one morning happened almost every morning after that, until I left the house. I woke up around 4.45am, to my door wide open and that feeling of dread again. I just got up closed it and then went back to my sleep only to find that my door was wide open again 
when I woke up to my alarm. Still, I thought nothing of it. That was until I was being woken between 4.30 and 5am every morning I had work. One morning, I woke to someone breathing on my face. I shot up, but there was nothing but the feeling of dread. It was getting to me now. I wasn't sleeping right or living right. I decided to place a pair of my trainers against the door before I went to bed, and still my door would be wide open with a load of pressure and feeling of dread all over me, and I wouldn't be able to get back to sleep. I was getting more tired as the days went on. When I confronted John about all this, he told me that he was shocked. He told me he heard voices coming from the hallway while he's in bed, and there's been knocking on his bedroom door. He thought it was me messing about, but when he opened his door, my door was shut, and there was no way I'd make it back to my room that quick without making a noise. He told me there was more whispering and knocking on his door when I wasn't there. It got to a point where when I went to bed and when John wasn't there, I would leave all the lights on and TV on all night in the house. If I had to go to the toilet, I'd wait until I was almost bursting to go, and as soon as I got home from work, I'd go straight up the stairs and not move from my room. Nights after, I kept waking up, and it was tiring me right out. That feeling of dread. It was like the presence was watching me sleep. It wasn't long after all this that I eventually moved house again to my aunt's. Everything there was calmer, although it was the amount of spirits in that house that freaked me out. The male presence in the house didn't like me at all. I felt that the spirit was unable to approach me mentally as my nan was blocking him out and instead he was trying to wear me down physically. For what purpose, I'll never know. And in a way, I'm glad I never will. I've never gone back to that house and I doubt I ever will. I just feel bad for that little boy. I was 12 years old when my father got a big promotion to another country. This meant, of course, that my family and I would be moving away. One of the perks of the promotion was that the company would pay for most important expenses, school, medical, and house rent. Why am I telling you this? It's important to know for what follows, and I don't want for people to think that we were in any way wealthy, as we really were just using the company's money. Anyway, my parents looked mostly for an apartment near the school. My siblings and I were going to be attending. And they found this very beautiful one that had almost a room for each kid and one big one for themselves. Now in this country, mahogany is very, very common. And for those who might not be familiar with the wood, it's both very heavy and very firm. All the doors and cabinets were made out of this same wood. We soon moved into the flat. And all was well for a couple of months, save for a few times a week where the bathroom in front of the dining room would open on its own very slowly. I remember my parents and I jokingly asking the ghost to let us have dinner in peace. Back then, my youngest brother was still a baby and he had a lot of battery toys that would sometimes turn on without anyone pushing buttons or the sort. Again, easily explained by everyone since baby toys aren't exactly treated with a lot of care, so maybe they were broken. I thought so, at least. As the months went by, we started growing used to these things, and slowly we stopped caring about them, since they were our new normal now. One day, my father had to tell this man that the company wouldn't be supplying them with any more products. They argued. The man threatened my father that this wouldn't be the last time he heard of him. After this event, nothing out of the ordinary happened at home, just more of the same. One day, approximately a month later, I had my first glasses prescribed and on my face. That night, while my mother was making dinner, I was asked to watch over my baby brother while he was watching cartoons in my parents' bedroom. Suddenly, I see this very corporeal figure that very closely resembled my mother, only it was wearing their hair up in a pale dress, walking down the hall towards my bedroom. Now, being a young teenager, I didn't like my parents in my room, and I was very sure I had just seen my mother going there, so I called out and got no answer. I picked up my brother and headed out of the bedroom and went looking for my mother towards my room. It was getting late, 
so the windowless corridor was pretty much impossible to walk through without turning a light on. But everything was dark, even the remaining bedrooms. I called out again, thinking that maybe she had just gone in with the lights out regardless, only to hear her voice coming from the kitchen. Connected to my bedroom, there was an emergency exit with a spiral staircase. And even though we were on a very high level, I'm talking above floor 15, my immediate thought was that someone had broken in and was hiding in my room or in my other brother's room. I was scared shitless. I went to the kitchen to inform my mother that someone had broken in. I had to literally force her to check both my bedroom and my brother's because I was 100% sure that I had seen someone. We even checked in the little space near the emergency exit, the only door that had a key 24-7 and whose only copy was in the kitchen below all the cutlery. Nothing. My mother managed to convince me it was my imagination, an effect that happened because of me not being used to my glasses. That night, my parents were talking in the kitchen and she told my father, very amused, what happened earlier. Laughing, she expected his answer, but he stayed silent. Turning around, she saw he was crying. Apparently, ever since we had moved, he had been dreaming of a woman that fit the same description I had given my mother. She was understandably worried. Not only was her daughter seeing things that weren't there, but her husband was going crazy too. I mean, put yourself in her shoes. They went to bed, avoiding the subject. The master bed bathroom's light during the night was always left on, while all the other lights in the house were off, in case anyone wanted to head out of their rooms in the middle of the night. That night, like every other, the bathroom light was on. My parents were going to sleep when my mother suddenly heard very clearly the switch being turned on. She managed to convince my father to check it out, even if he was sure it was the light burning out. But much to his surprise, the light switch had actually been pressed to turn it off. My mother flipped. She woke everyone up and made us all sleep together in the living room. She was livid. Since that night, she would feel someone touching her in her sleep, even when my father was out of town. The toys would all turn on together at the same time regardless if we had switched them off. The door of the bathroom near the dining room would violently swing open. Several times, my parents would wake up at night to find my baby brother sleeping on the floor when he could barely crawl. My other brother started sleepwalking around this time and randomly screaming to the top of his lungs while asleep. He would never remember that he dreamt. Whenever my parents were about to have sex, they would close the door, and the door would always open itself again. Now, the door would be closed during other times, and it would remain shut, hence why it's attention worthy. If we went out for the weekend, any plant we had would be uprooted and appear on the other side of the house. After about a year of these things happening constantly on a daily basis, my grandmother came to visit us. She slept in my room while I slept in my brother's spare bed. Maybe it hasn't been obvious, but we didn't talk about these things. It was taboo, and no one wanted to acknowledge these things were happening. Us not talking about it meant we didn't tell anyone coming into our home either, and my grandma was no exception. The first week of her stay went by, and she approached my mother. As she was about to tell her what she had been feeling last week, my mother interrupted her and asked her if she had been getting touched at night. They both were feeling the same things. You may be wondering why I mentioned my father arguing with that man when he was let go. The argument went as follows, more or less. Man, you can't do this to me. You'll regret it. Father, well, I can't continue allowing you to do this poorly. No, you don't understand. I'm a very important figure in a satanic cult. I will make you pay for this. Well, good to know. I'm a father. Have a good day. After knowing this... I've reached the conclusion that this man had something to do with all of this. We moved out, soon after my grandma left, thankfully, and I never saw it again. At least not as corporeal as that time. Just shadows in my peripheral vision. But thanks to this experience, I can tell if a place feels similar to the presence I felt in that apartment. We started discussing our experience in the apartments only after we had moved, hence why I have information about different things in which I wasn't present. A family friend who had been able to see things since he was a child and confirmed as soon as we started talking about it that he had seen it. 
He had dreamt about the same woman my father and I had seen before even sharing the description. He even disclosed that he had talked to her and she promised she would first make my mother go crazy and then go after me. It was February of 1984. My mum was about five months pregnant with myself and my twin. She was driving home down a winding road. She had made the drive a thousand times before. Same road, same destination, never deviating. However, that day was different. As she drove, she noticed a little girl, no more than six, playing on the side of the road. As my mum slowed, and as she drove past the little girl, smiled and waved. My mother remembers her vividly. Cute, curly brown hair, dimpled cheeks, and a 1960s style daisy dress. My mum drove home, but she was haunted by a constant nagging voice in her head, telling her to go back. She had just pulled up outside our house when she turned the car around and drove back. It was a 15 minute return trip to the site. By the time my mum got back there, the sun had started to set. My mum slowed and approached the grassy area the girl was playing in and noticed she was still there. Worried, my mum asked if the little girl was okay. The girl replied, I'm not sure how to get home. My mother inquired further, asking if she knew her address, to which the little girl replied no. But it's a big house with gates, and it's just past her school. Driving down the same road for years, my mum couldn't remember ever seeing a school. So she asked the little girl if she'd like some help to go find it, and then they could use it to find her home. The girl said yes, and my mum helped her into the car. She started driving, and as she drove, she asked the little girl her name. She replied Abigail. They spoke about what the school looked like, about Abigail's friends, what she liked to do. By then, ten minutes had gone by and no school had appeared. Suddenly, Abigail screamed, Down there! My school's down there! My mum took a left turn down a winding country lane. Eventually, they arrived at an old school building. Knowing where the school was, Abigail managed to guide my mum to her home. It was down a really long gravel track. The house was an enormous Edwardian-style house. It dwarfed her in a green Honda Accord. But before she could get in, she was stopped by a security guard at the gates. She explained that she had found Abigail playing by the side of the road, and she was worried, so brought her home. The security guard looked at my mum, perplexed, then went into his little hut and made a call. The gates opened, and my mum was ushered through. She pulled up just outside the front door and was met by an elderly lady. My mum turned to Abigail and said, wait in the car, she'll be right back. Approaching the old lady, my mum explained what had happened and asked if she was the girl's grandmother. To which the old lady said, no, I'm her mother, but you can't have Abigail with you. She was hit by a car almost 20 years ago while on a family walk. My mum was taken aback, adamant she took the lady to the back of the car and to let Abigail out. But when my mum got to the car, Abigail wasn't there. The back seat was empty. My mum went into a panic and started hyperventilating, she was taken into the house where she was told what happened to Abigail and that she wasn't the first to bring her home. My mum pulled herself together and left. She headed home, passing the same grassy patch Abigail was found, but she wasn't there. My mum never saw Abigail again, but inquired from time to time with Abigail's mum. They eventually erected a memorial on the site of the crash that killed Abigail. My mum learned that since, no one had seen her or brought her home. It appears that the memorial settled her restless spirit. My dad died about six weeks ago, and I hadn't seen him since Christmas. Since he died, I fairly constantly felt more of a presence in my flat than usual. The living room in particular just feel like he's around somehow. I know these are fairly common experiences after bereavement and while grieving regardless, so I'm specifically asking about something else I've been experiencing. About a week after dad died, I heard a noise from the living room while I was about to go to sleep. For context, because of the weird layout of our flat, the living room and bedroom have an adjoining door that's usually open at night. It was very clear and fairly loud and came from that direction. 
It was a single clinking metallic noise, like the sound you get when you tap a teaspoon against a mug, or when someone taps a knife on a glass to give a speech at a wedding. That's the best way I can describe it. Rationally, I thought it was one of those weird noises your brain produces when you're falling asleep that jerks you awake. But it felt so clear and external that I instinctively asked my husband, what was that? And he said, the sound like someone stirring their tea? Yeah, I heard that too. It's only happened once or twice since then, always at night, always quite loud and always from the same place. I'm usually awake longer than my husband, so after the first time, I've had nobody else to verify. But I've not been actively falling asleep, so I doubt it's hypnagogic. It's more startling than actually scary. We have pet rats in the living room who do make a fair bit of noise at night, but that's more consistent rattling on moving around rather than one distinct isolated sound. We also haven't got much anything in their cage and that could make that very clear chiming noise. I never heard it before dad's death either and something about it doesn't feel explainable. It's funny me connecting it to dad because he was very dismissive of the supernatural. But even before these sounds started, I felt the need to talk in my head to this presence, asking him not to manifest in any overt way, because I don't think I could handle it right now. It almost feels like he's trying to say I'm here, without freaking me out too much. Not that I haven't been able to before, but it was only to those who would want to hear. Not all the people who have experienced these things with me even want to recollect what had happened, and I don't blame them. It's not to be dramatic or anything, really. Some things weren't that intimidating. They were just weird. Before I got off track, I'd more or less like to introduce myself and the people who have been through these occurrences with me. I've had these things happen throughout my childhood at my house that I grew up in until I moved out at 15. These things would happen to me, my brother, his girlfriend at the time, my cousin, and two of my best friends. Now, to be completely honest... I really cannot recall when all these things started happening, or how old I was, but it was somewhere between the ages of 10 to 15, where things happened frequently enough that I can remember. Though I'd have to say the first occurrence I was told happened when I was merely six, and even when my brother's girlfriend told me this, I was shocked, because I swore it was just some weird dream I had. Anyways, I guess I can start there. I must have been 12, when let's call her Elisa and I were talking about when she first started dating my brother. We had a Thanksgiving dinner at my place, and I couldn't fathom why, since my family is absolutely huge, and my house is just really small. Adults gathered on the main floor while the children were put downstairs. Really the only the way? Oh God. Anywhere between 14 to 20 of us were there. Like I mentioned, I was six, so I can't really remember the exact amount, but there were enough people that we were quite literally all couldn't fit on the main floor. One of my cousins and I were playing on the stairs. We both got to pick a Hot Wheels car from one of my uncle's collection, and we were testing them out on the ramp alongside the staircase. Now, I can't recall exactly why I went upstairs. I know I wanted to ask someone something, probably when dinner was going to be served. I made my way to the living room, where the adults were. Elisa and one of my aunts were sitting on a couch together talking, and beside them in the corner of the room, something caught my eye just hovering there, this tall, black, ominous being. I'm not sure, but it engulfed the corner and looked as if it were watching everyone. And as I was watching it, all of a sudden I heard, hey sweetie, what are you looking at? Elisa asked me as she turned her head to the corner and immediately got my aunt's attention. Just as she did, my aunt said, did you see that? What was that? How long was it there for? Back and forth, they went asking each other. They were freaked out, but not really loud about it. I think they just wanted to believe they didn't see it. Still weird though. No one else in the room acknowledges this happening other than them. I was in the doorway, basically right beside the corner, where this dark entity was kind of just observing my family. I don't remember being scared or really feeling anything. I looked back at Elisa and my aunt, and then back to the corner, and it was gone. So me and my boyfriend at the time were 13. We lived in a not so great area. 
I live across from a park that has a woods where rape and rumors of murder have happened. So we decided to go into there to mess around. I took my camera. I can't find the footage as it was stored on my last phone. But we had entered and we sat at a bench and placed my phone on a flipped bench so it could record us. We started to hear stuff around us, but we called it off as it's a public park until the phone had flown off the bench a meter or two like it had been thrown, even though we were watching it. So of course we were freaked out. So as the kids, we'd walked around to try to calm our nerves and we had heard things and seen stuff out of our eyes, the usual story. So after about half an hour, we head home and I reviewed the footage and I found a shadow figure standing, just watching us, fully black, no definition, just the outline of a body, a kid's face in a bush, voices and footsteps that wasn't ours, the main voice that we caught sounded like a child laughing. In the same place as the shadow figure, there were three. A smaller one, the same one as before, and one around the same height as the original. This was about six minutes after the first shadow. I'm currently trying to recover the footage, but the phone is battered, and I don't know my Apple ID, as I made it at eight. I believe it's not backed up. Anyway, I'll leave updates if I find the footage. Back in 2013, I was 13 years old, living with my mom, who at the time was a single parent with my sister and two little brothers. The oldest was around five and a half, while the other was more than four and a half. We lived in a townhouse in Prince George. Nothing was out of the ordinary moving in until my two younger brothers started playing tag with each other. The thing is, they would occasionally both run away from someone or something. It confused me, my mom and sister, thinking nothing of it as an overactive imagination. The both of them coming up with an additional playmate to add to their game. The most uneasy part of the game was when we would stop the two of them and ask both of them, what are you running from? They'd say, our friend. Then my brothers would look around for their friend as if he'd up and vanished after any of us took notice. Things took a darn darker turn as my mom would work later night shifts just to support all of us. She would ask me or my sister if either of us could babysit after school. We would. I remember one night I was in my room playing on my PS3 and getting a text from my sister saying to come down into the living room. Me being the eldest sibling, I get this wretched gut feeling of something wrong. I went downstairs and saw both of my little brothers and sisters on the couch. My two brothers in tears and my sister was confused and scared. She then told me that they saw something in their room. It was their friend, but he was just staring at both of them while hanging from one corner of the ceiling. I checked everywhere upstairs and nothing. After that incident, they never played tag again and occasionally say that their friend comes back and hangs from the corner of the ceiling, watching and never blinking. This story happened to my dad and I when I was younger. I think I was in elementary school, maybe middle school. We were living at my stepmom's house and when the time came, they had bought a house so we spent the whole week packing and moving. Once it was done to the final days, we were there, my dad and I were fixing and cleaning up anything that had broken. On the last day before we left, we went back to get the last of the stuff left behind. Once done, we went to the car and my dad said that he had to go pee. So since it wouldn't take long, I sat in the car. From the car, I was able to see straight into the house. We had a big window next to the door that pretty much let you see the whole living room. Well, I was looking in that direction and I saw the shadow of a woman clear as day directly past the window. I could make out her chest area and her long hair. Needless to say, I was so scared. I didn't know what to do. So I ran into the house because I knew my dad was in there. As I walked in, he was already passing the window at me. He asked me what I was doing and I said, oh, uh, I have to pee too. We looked at each other. He knew I was lying and then said, did you see the woman too? We were both scared. So we left the house quickly. That was the only ghost experience I had in that house. But I was happy to know it was my last experience in that house.
It was the summer of 2004, and we were taking a trip down to Tijuana, Mexico. At this time, my two younger brothers, twins, were a few months old, and my stepmom wanted her family to meet them. It was a very long trip. We got there, and holy hell, it was hot. The first night, it was normal. My dad and I slept in the living room, as it was the coolest room, and honestly, there weren't very many rooms in the house. Now, it was hot. So in place of a blanket, I used a bedsheet. In the house, there were only a few females. My now cousin and the older woman, very important to point that out, were the only females. The second night we were there, I just couldn't sleep. It wasn't too hot, but something was keeping me up. Like I was being watched and felt very, very insecure about it. I just laid there staring outside the sliding glass door that was open in order to let the house cool down. Again, I tried to sleep, so I closed my eyes. Nothing. Kept them shut. Nothing. And then I opened my eyes. There outside the door was a little girl, maybe five or six years old. Younger than me, for sure. She just stood there. I could see everything about her in detail. Long hair was very innocent, childlike features. Big brown eyes just locked on mine. I froze and couldn't move a muscle. We just stayed there looking at each other for what felt like hours. Once I got the nerve to think of anything else other than this little girl, I covered my face with the bed sheets and shut my eyes tight. I tried so hard to tell myself it wasn't real and that I couldn't sleep. I was screaming loudly in my head, go to sleep, go to sleep, she isn't real. And that's when I felt it. I stopped thinking of anything else except for what I was hearing. This little girl. I could hear her breathing in my ear. Every inhale and exhale was so loud, so clear, like she was pressing her nose on my ear. Then, with the softest voice, she said, Don't worry, I'll take care of you when you go to bed. Just like that, I fell asleep. When I woke up the next day, I didn't say much of what happened that night. Yet, I woke up not so scared because of what that little girl said. Now, I don't think any of us would really feel safe if a five, six-year-old boy or girl told us that they would take care of us. But I felt safe. I stayed pretty quiet that whole day. I played with some of the local kids. We talked about how different our lives were from Mexico to America found out what was similar. For the most part, the day was normal. It wasn't until I got late and I said goodbye to my new friends. I went back to my stepmom's old house and spoke to her uncle, Gabriel. He was a bit younger than my stepmom. He had a very deep voice, like a really manly man kind of voice that was actually very intimidating. He was mostly asking questions about me and I asked him if he had any kids. That's when his voice set and softened and he became a very sad man. Again, I asked him if he had any kids. He said he used to have a little girl. Because I was young, I stupidly asked, well, where is she? He looked at me with tears slowly building in his eyes. His throat dried and I could see how it became hard for him to swallow. Very quietly, he said, her name was Andrea and she died last year. I didn't know what to do or say. I could tell this man was still very broken up about it. That's when I remember what the little girl said to me last night. So I told him, your daughter, she was maybe six or seven with a very innocent face and brown eyes. His face lit up, but confused of how I knew something he never told me. All I could say was repeat what she had said to me that night. He cried more and more and said that she would say that to him when he would have trouble sleeping at night. He hugged me, thanked me, and I left the next morning. I hope I was able to help fix some of his broken pieces. I lived in the house where all the shit takes place from ages 9 to 23. My parents got divorced when I was 14. I lived with my parents, younger brother and grandma. My younger brother was the first to notice something strange in the house. One night in 2005, 
He woke us up at about 11pm crying, saying there was someone outside the window. Living in South Africa, such things are possible. So my dad went to inspect and found nothing. A few weeks later, my aunt came to visit from out of town and was sleeping in my grandmama's room. They relayed to us the next morning that she was awoken by the door opening and a figure staring at her from around the corner. Fast forward a few years to 2007-8. I would normally stay alone at home when my dad would go out fishing with my bro for the weekend. This is when I started noticing odd things happening. Keys would go missing, lights would be on after I knew I had switched them off. Small things, but significant enough for me to take note. 2010 is when shit got real. I was in my last year of high school and working part-time for my dad, who has an office in the same property as the house. I was working on a file and left it on the desk for lunch. When I returned, the file was gone. No one else could have taken it, as the only other staff member was the receptionist. About a week later, we found the file one morning laying on the floor. That weekend, a friend of mine stayed over in my brother's room when we came home from a party. It must have been 1 or 2 a.m. when we got into bed. I was already falling asleep when I heard him scream for me. I go to my friend, who's literally sweating, asked him what the fuck happened, and said someone was choking him as soon as he closed his eyes to sleep. From that day, I'd been seeing the man, as we named him, around the property. I've seen him while working on my car in the garage. I've seen him while doing dishes. My father has even seen him sitting in the garden. I never see his face, but he's always wearing a blue overall. Like the ones construction workers wear. It wasn't serious until I got married and had a kid. This takes us to October 2019. My son is one and a half years old. He refuses to be in this house. He cries constantly when we visit my dad, and as soon as we leave, he's perfectly well behaved. Two weekends ago, my dad had gone out fishing, my brother was MIA, and I had to come feed the cats, switch on the lights, etc. I came in at about 7pm that Saturday night, and as soon as I walked into the house, felt a chill. Thinking nothing about it, carried on with what I had to do. While in the kitchen, I heard heavy footsteps in the lounge and breaking of glass. I went to investigate and found a vase that is normally on the cabinet about five meters away, on the floor in pieces. I locked up and got the fuck out of there. I told my wife the story when I got home and she suggested I burn frankincense around the house and read some prayers. Sunday morning, I set out on my mission and started burning frankincense and praying around the house. When I got to the office, I had just started praying when the glass sliding door shattered. Since then, my son hasn't been fussing when he comes here, and the atmosphere seems to be lighter around the house. As a child, I had a considerable amount of phobias. I feared snakes, heights, spiders, centipedes, roller coasters, the mask section at Walmart during Halloween, and the dark. Other than snakes, the dark was the fear that persisted the longest. I remember the first time I truly felt a fear of monsters in the dark. It was 2004, and I was six years old. My family was walking out of a movie, and I saw one of the large posters that hung on the wall. It was for Seed of Chucky, which, if you weren't aware, is from the Child's Play series. This poster in particular showcased a mangled Chucky with large slices that had been stitched up standing with his doll wife over a bassinet. A baby's arm could be seen reaching upwards towards the two, holding a very gothic-looking baby rattle. At the time, the only thing that really drew my attention was the face of Chucky. I imagined him coming into my room to kill me or kidnap me. I was worried I would see his sinister smiling face when I looked through my bedroom window at night. From that point on, and for a period of about two years, I refused to sleep in my room. I insisted on sleeping in my parents' bed, sheltered between them for my own safety. As I'm sure any parents would, mine got tired of this routine. Sleeping in their bed was no longer an option, but neither was sleeping in mine. Enter the bravery bed. This ironically named twin mattress was placed on the floor next to their bed. 
I was to come from my room to this thin mattress from now on if I felt scared, so as not to disturb my parents. Sleeping on the floor did not feel as secure as sleeping on an elevated king mattress. Snuggle between the two people who you think will protect you from most of your childhood monsters. I didn't know that neither of my mother nor my father would be awake to see my monster. I was almost seven years old, and on this particular night, I absolutely refused to sleep on my bed, or the bravery bed. Being as terrified of the dark as I was, my parents knew to leave their bedroom door open, with the hallway light on, so I could see my surroundings and know nothing was lurking. I woke up, and nothing felt odd at first. I had simply woken up from a dream, and there was nothing wrong. But slowly, I felt a sense of unease rise within me. It's like the feeling you get when you know you're going to shiver. Like eyes were on the back of my neck, and they weren't my mom's or dad's. I felt myself sit up in bed, almost involuntarily, and my gaze was glued in the direction of the open door and out into the hallway. This build-up of anxious energy kept increasing, and it was pure entropy, like anything could happen in the next moment. The next thing I felt was a wave of dread wash over me. It was the first time I had experienced an emotion like that, so it was all the more unnerving. I couldn't breathe, I couldn't speak, and I couldn't remove my eyes from the lit hallway, no matter how hard I tried. The dread kept intensifying, and I would have cried from fear had it been possible in that moment. It was then... And I finally saw the source of my terror. It hobbled out of my room and into the hallway. It was hunched over at a severe angle, and I could see the shape of its spine clearly. It was crouched with its thin legs, and I saw that its feet were much too long to be a human's. Its arms were bent, forearms jutting forward, and the hands were long and bony. I imagined that this creature must have clawed, shrugged, and crawled itself out from the deepest and darkest pit of hell to come into my house. While I couldn't breathe, if there was any air left in my lungs, it was sucked out in that moment. I was paralysed, whether of my own physical malfunction or by the will of this dark goblin, I know not. The most unsettling feature of the monster was that no light made contact with its skin. I was staring at pure shadow, black as the void, it continued to hobble down the hallway and disappeared into a wall. Once it was out of sight, my soul frame collapsed backwards into the mattress and I was asleep again. Having been a child with a vast imagination, I didn't doubt that this was a nightmare. The next morning I was a little spooked, but I continued into my day otherwise unaffected. I thought of the silhouette didn't cross my mind. That is, until the nightmare resumed into my waking hours. I was walking down the same hallway, out into the dining room, and towards the garage door, where I expected my mother to arrive at any moment. I had just made it past the dining table, and was about a dozen feet from the garage door where my body froze, and I felt the dread wash over me a second time. I couldn't move, speak, or scream for help. My eyes were fixed straight ahead of me, and I could only sit and wait for whatever was coming. To my horror... The same evil shadow I had seen the night prior entered my vision once more, making its way from left to right as it had done before, this time appearing from the pantry. In what I thought was my nightmare, it never came closer than a couple dozen feet. In this episode, it was not six feet away from me. It shuffled slowly, and I could see the spine, hands and feet in more detail than before. They were grotesque in every sense of the word, and if my body had let me, I would have vomited at the sight. I couldn't follow the creature with my eyes as it made its way from one side of the peripheral vision to the other. It was nowhere to be seen after it had exited my vision and I could move again, but it was hard to. I was in utter disbelief and I couldn't even bring myself to cry yet. My lip quivered softly and my breath was shallow and irregular. I didn't want to look in any other direction because I was afraid it would appear in some other part of the room. My brother broke the silence when she opened the garage door, groceries in hand. She saw me and immediately asked, Are you alright? I couldn't help myself. I broke down, screaming and sobbing. To my mother, it probably looked like I'd gone insane with hysteria. 
I refused to describe what happened until well after the incident. From then on, I couldn't be left alone in any setting. Hallways and long stairways were added to my already long list of phobias. It was almost two years later when my parents took me to a child psychiatrist with whom I could work with and process my fears. The ultimate aim was to put the monster, which was now a constant thought, to bed. After several sessions, I was able to give it a name and draw it into a picture of something I didn't fear. Clowns. I named it Horridge, which was my way of sneaking horror into a name, because he honestly still horrified me. That picture hung on the fridge for years, and Horridge would greet me every day, desensitizing me to its influence. My fear soon became curiosity, which developed into a fascination with the unknown. When I was about 13 years old, I had long stopped being afraid of the dark and didn't bother taking anything to drink with me up to my room for the night. And so it happened that one night, I got thirsty and decided to go downstairs for some water. As I could see clearly enough in the dark of the kitchen, I didn't bother to put on the light and got myself a drink. My entire family was in a deep sleep and the entire house was quiet and covered in dark as no windows were open and all the curtains stayed closed. On my way back to my room, I passed the hallway as usual. This one night, something weird happened. As I put one foot on the stairs, a sudden cold wind blew through the hallway, sending shivers down my neck and back as I heard a voice saying my name, followed by, I am a ghost. The voice sounded raspy and like nothing I ever heard before. The moment I started hearing the voice, I quickly ran upstairs into my room and hid under my covers. All I heard from there was a soft laugh and that same voice coming from downstairs. I didn't sleep that night. Just stayed awake listening if I heard anything until my parents woke up. I told them as soon as I heard them, but they wouldn't believe me. The entire thing sounds like something you'd see in a kid's movie, and that just makes it unbelievable for anyone that wasn't there. I never forgot to take water with me to bed from that day onwards. 